tail recursion. So functional programming is this idea that you can organize entire programs according to pure functions, which are modular, can be combined in interesting ways, and also have other advantages. So functional programming is a very broad term, but often refers to the following properties. That all functions are pure functions. They don't have side effects. There's no reassignment, no mutable data types. When you create something, it's there to stay. And the name value bindings that you create are permanent as well. When you have these things, then you gain certain advantages. First, the value of an expression is independent of the order in which sub-expressions are evaluated. Now, we could just pick a particular order, and that's what we do in Python, but wouldn't it be nice if we could choose any order we want depending on the circumstances? In particular, we could evaluate sub-expressions in parallel if we had multiple different processing units, or we could even wait and see if we really need the value of a sub-expression before getting around to evaluating it. These things are product of referential transparency. This idea that the value of an expression doesn't change when you substitute one of its sub-expressions with the value of that sub-expression, which allows you to do things like memoization without ever worrying that you're changing the behavior of your program. So these are all good things. And so functional programming has a lot of excitement around it, especially in this era when computers are having more and more processing units. Wouldn't it be nice to just parallelize work automatically? But one might wonder if there are no for and while statements because we're not allowed to rebind a name to a new value, can we really make basic iterative procedures efficient? Or are we just stuck using recursion and recursion is slow, and so there's no way these languages could ever be fast? Well, it turns out there's an answer to this question. You can make a functional programming language just as efficient as one that's not by using this idea of tail recursion that we're going to talk about today. So let's look at an example. Recursion versus iteration in Python. In Python, recursive calls always create new active frames. Let's see what that means. Well, let's say we're writing a function factorial nk that computes k times n factorial. Here's a recursive definition. If n is 0, we just return k because 0 factorial is 1. Otherwise, we return a recursive call where n is decremented and also multiplied in to the constant so that we've accumulated all of the different terms of the factorial by the time we reach n is 0. And here's an iterative definition. Factorial nk. While n is greater than 0, rebind n and k to n minus 1 and k times n and then return k. So the same logic is being applied in both of these cases, but there is a difference. The difference in time is only up to a constant factor. This is a linear time recursion, but linear time recursions take linear amounts of space. The iterative version also takes linear time. You have to go through the body of this while statement many times, once for each n, and then it gets decremented each time. But we only have a constant amount of space because we have a constant number of names that we have to remember, n, n, k, and factorial, regardless of how big n is. So how do we bridge this gap between the space that's required for a factorial in the recursive sense versus the iterative one? That's the whole idea of what we're talking about today. If you read the specification of the language scheme, it says implementations of scheme are required to be properly tail recursive. This allows the execution of an iterative computation in constant space, even if the iterative computation is described by a syntactically recursive procedure. So remember we have our iterative version in Python which takes linear time but constant space. 
The idea is that if you write the same logic as the scheme procedure, so this says the way you compute n time, k times n factorial is you check and see if n is zero, then you return k, otherwise you make a recursive call. And that should use resources like this. But how do we do that? Well, the answer is that we eliminate the middleman. We eliminate frames that we don't need anymore when we make recursive calls. Let me show you which frames those are. So we're back in Python. We're looking at the recursive definition of factorial. And as we step through it, we see that each call to factorial creates a new frame. And here we have n bound to 4, here n bound to 3, n bound to 2. Soon we'll have n bound to 1 and n bound to 0, which is the final state. Now, what's going to be returned? Well, this one's going to return 240, we see that. But notice that each one of these other calls is also just going to return the result of the last one. 40, 40, 240, 240, 240, and we're done. Now, there was no need to keep around this n and this k in order to figure out that we were just going to return whatever we got back from the next call. So all these extra frames in the middle, they were needed briefly in order to figure out how to make the recursive call, but they weren't needed anymore after the recursive call was made. We kept them around anyway because that's how Python works, but a properly tail recursive language will not do that.